Uh, thanks, Wendy, old friend, <laughs> young friend. Um, and thanks to uh, everyone for tuning in. Um, what I want to try to do in the next few minutes is sort of answer a question that I know has been nagging you, a mystery of how the web escaped from the confines of Europe and made it to the, to the Western Hemisphere, to the U.S. So Bringing the Web to America <clears throat> is the title of my talk. But it's also an overview, I think, of what the capabilities of the web are, you know, at that time and also clearly remain today. Um, everybody, I think, certainly knows the story of the web at CERN um, and maybe have read the papers, et cetera. Um, but really, there's a number of backstories that, that really sort of you know, led to the conclusions that, uh, that Tim and Robert actually reached when they were putting this technology together. Um, I don't know how many of you actually know who the, the second website or the third website or the fourth website were after the one at CERN, but the hint that I will give you is that they were all high energy physics labs in Europe. <clears throat> so you're seeing a trend here at the very beginning about not only where the web was created, but who the initial users were. And that was at Rutherford Lab in the UK, Desi Lab in Hamburg, and um, in Amsterdam. And everyone is familiar too, I think has seen the picture, the famous picture of, of Tim's next machine, which was the first web server, uh, especially with the label that's stuck on it saying, do not turn this off, because effectively doing so, is going to disrupt the universe of higher energy physics research. Um, in my opinion, I think what we have at that time is that higher energy physics and the web, it happened because Tim realized that it was a perfect fit um, between these two disciplines. Because in reality, higher energy physics is a very collaborative endeavor. Um, physicists all over the world you know, co-author papers, they need to share experimental data, <clears throat> especially between the sites where the data is being collected and their home institutions. Um, they do joint analyses. Um, they need to reference documents. They need to keep track of minutes and things such as that of their meetings. Um, there's no way, clearly it was realized that this could be done without computing. And so computing is an essential component of higher energy physics. But for the most part, physicists think of computing as a necessary evil. Um, and they generally only want to learn just enough in order to accomplish their particular those particular tasks. They'd much rather be doing physics than learning such mundane things as different operating systems different mail systems so they can communicate with their colleagues, how to various database query commands so they can get information from distributed databases. The other issue at that particular time is that these labs also supported a wide variety of different computing systems. You know, some of them use PDP-10s like DEC and other ones, you know, IBM equipment and things such as that. And they had different networking infrastructures. And part of this is in parallel with the way in which the internet finally became pervasive around the world. But what the perfect thing is, as far as the web was concerned, is it kind of did away with all of this. You know, it provided a platform, uh, and I have a typo here, and applications that were effectively operable in a neutral environment. And all of the above is pretty much what brought the web to America. Um, my institution, which also is a higher energy physics lab, is SLAC, the Stan used to be the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Now it's actually the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. And um, it was founded in 1962, uh, and it's operated at, by Stanford University and its proximity to the grounds of Stanford University. Um, and it is 
at least at that time, was a primary research facility for higher energy physics and basic energy science. And, and it has a long time history of collaboration with Stern. And it actually became the fifth website in the world and the first website in America outside of Europe. Um, but why? What was it about Slack that really had at least that first site for American site, you know, as its destination? <clears throat> well, the major reason is that Slack is and was at that time the home of what was called the Spires HEP preprints database. Um, and this is a homegrown database system from Stanford that has its own query language. And it's widely used by physicists for paper reviews and citations. And of course, citations, for one thing, is the lifeblood of a lot of physicists because that's what gets them funding, that's what gets them tenure, et cetera, et cetera. So having access to this database was incredibly important you know, to all of the physicists in the HEP community. However, the problem was, is that this database was notoriously difficult to access. And a lot of people tried to come up with different mechanisms for doing it, such as precursors to short messages and making queries, and even sending the QSpire server email that contained, you know, commands. But none of these really worked. And sort of the feeling at the time is if you were someone from Slack, and you visited CERN, one of the invariably, one of the questions that you got there is when are you guys gonna fix Q spires? When are you guys gonna make Q spires more usable? Um, and seeing how that evolved, you have to say that some of the credit for what happened actually goes to Steve Jobs. Um, Paul Kuntz was a physicist at Slack, and he was a frequent visitor to CERN. Uh, doing such things as teaching C++ classes, as well as collaborating in some of the experiments. And Paul and Tim were both big enthusiasts over the next machine. That's where the credit goes to Steve Jobs. And so when Paul would go to CERN, he would actually get together with Tim at that, that uh, just to see what was the latest and the greatest on the next. And so when they got together at one point, it was not so much because of discussion of the CERN, of the web rather, but actually to see how each of them was attempting to use the next machine in their work at their respective institutions. But one thing Paul saw when he was there is he saw that the CERN, um, the Tim's machine, the first CERN web server could actually access the CERN phone directory. And the question that he posed was, could that web back, could that mean that the web is gonna be possible to access any database over the internet, not just on CERNnet, which was then the local uh, network around the lab. And if it couldn't access it over the internet, why not? And straight away, Tim demonstrated, sure, the CERN server could in fact access spires or Q spires. And so this meant at least envision that there was a simple solution to that Q spires nightmare was over, that people could now have ready access to the information that they wanted in that database. So a bunch of web wizards, which is what we called ourselves at Slack, took the initiative to launch a Slack web server with the primary intention, as it were, of serving up to the world Q spires, giving access to exactly the kinds of data that the physicists want that was in that database. Um, this was a pretty hoary you know, task because effectively it meant taking the CERN code set and making it run on a totally different system, namely IBM VMS. Um, and it was, as, as I said, specifically designed to support access to spires. But it worked, and the web interface to QSpires was far superior to any previous application or effort that they had tried before, such things as the email or the short messages. 
And on December 12th, 1991, this server was made available at Slack. And the following day, Tim actually referred to QSpire's access as the first killer app for the web. And this is what it looked like. Certainly this is not impressive by today's standards in that particular case. But what you actually saw was the ability to access the Spires database, as well as with the text box, if you knew the command language for QSpires, you would be able to enter it directly. And that was in fact, very revolutionary. Um, as it turns out, web access to Spires was the first demonstrable web database interface over the internet. And at Slack, we like to sort of imagine is suppose we had in fact patented that concept, especially then with the later advent of e-commerce, we could have gotten a piece of the action for so much that has transpired since then. And in fact, saying that at one point, there was a lawsuit attempting to prove that Slack had in fact not created that first database access, but of course they lost. Along that time, Robert Cayo actually then created the first web t-shirts. This was a limited edition of five shirts, actually six because of the generic one. And what you had on this particular t-shirt was in a circle of five, all of those higher energy physics labs that in fact existed at that point in time. And the joke, as you can see in this, is that in this particular picture at the very top, the, the, the announcement is basically, yes, you too can be on the web. There was also the joke from Robert at the time is that perhaps at some point we would have to do away with the circle and this list of websites could possibly encase your body. So go around your chest and around your back. Of course, now since we've calculated then that if you did something like that, your t-shirt would wind up being a solid color. And here are two of the criminals at that particular time and wearing our respective t-shirts at the laboratory. This was another design that we had because certainly we perceive that the web as being one of the major contributions of higher energy physics. So whether or not many people in the world realize or appreciate the science that comes out of laboratories such as CERN and such as Slack, it's spinoffs such as the web that continue in fact to influence our lives. And so that's why we like to think in some ways that in higher energy physics, the web is actually the second big bang. 